Man, I enjoyed the worship this morning. It was an awesome time in the Lord. It's good to be back in Oklahoma where God lives, but he chooses to visit everywhere else, right? Right? I have figured it out being in the frozen chosen. This is truly the best state in America. And so I love Minneapolis and Minnesota, but it's awesome to be here. I've got some special friends here joining us today from Tulsa and uh, one of our part teammates from Latin America. He flew in last night and I just got back from Saudi Arabia last night and I'm here today. I'm like, come on, Faith Church. I love being here at Faith Church. And most importantly, it's because I love your pastors. I love Pastor Kelly and Lisa. I really do. You guys are class leaders. You really are. Uh, I would call Pastor Kelly sometime and say, hey, can I run this thought by you? Can you give me some wisdom? You know, if you don't notice, you see Pastor Kelly, he's got some salt and pepper up there. And so that doesn't mean he's old. That means he's seasoned, okay? Wisdom, right? Right? And so, man, I am just ecstatic to what God is doing uh, in this house today. And, you know, friends, I want to share something with you because uh, this morning I'm going to be talking about a matter that I think is so important for all of us. But I'm really feeling this burden on my heart this morning uh, to equip you. So if you don't know me, my name is Will Jones. And like John Maxwell says, I'm your friend. Uh, So you can listen to me today. It's awesome. And if you don't, I got the microphone, so you got to listen anyway. Uh, But uh, I really want to challenge you today um, something that's just near and dear in my heart uh, when it comes to the gospel and who we are as people of God. Um, You know, the the stats tell us today that the evangelical witness is declining. What that means is that Christians aren't sharing about the life transformation that we're experiencing in Christ. And man, Christianity was never meant to be this this me religion. It it was meant to be a religion that was selfless. It was meant to be a religion that was basically calling you to live dead. And uh, I am just so thrilled. And you kind of get a good thing today, but you're also going to get a challenge thing. Because, again, I just got back from Saudi Arabia. And there, uh, God just continues to open up countries around the world to allow people to hear the gospel. And this was a country that was closed for years. We heard some believers, we were in house churches where it was just different groups of ethnicities, Filipinos, Pakistanians, uh, Saudi Arabians, all different types of people that have been praying for 30 years. Come on, that's discouraging, isn't it? (laughs) We want to pray for five minutes, but God do it. 30 years. And they're finally seeing God open up this country that was closed that people are getting able, having access to come into now to share the gospel with some arguably would say the second largest religion in the world. And my friends, I want to tell you, some of you, God will call you not just to your context locally. But some of you, you may even be calling to countries like that. And the message that I'm going to talk about today, I want to give you hope, but I also want to challenge you because it's really time out for us as Christians being selfish. It really is, church. We, man, there's so many people out there dying without hope. I mean, we just had, I don't know, we had seven cases in, in our school district where my church is in Minneapolis of suicides in the high school this year. And I'm like, but we have youth coming to church every Wednesday said, Jesus, I love you, Jesus. But they never share the gospel. There's a disconnect there. And I'm saying, God, help us as a church. Really help us. Holy Spirit, help us. And the Holy Spirit shared something with me today. I'm going to just share it because Pastor Kelly said I'm at home. I'm going to just share it really from my heart and obviously from the word of God. But the Holy Spirit said something to me the other day as I was over in the Middle East. And what he said to me was, well, I want to be the comforter for many people. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will be our comforter. But he says, I can't be that simply because there are people that aren't getting out of their comfort zone. And it really opened up my understanding to the work of the power and the Holy Spirit in our lives because he really is the comforter. But in order to experience comfort, you've got to relinquish security. You've got to relinquish control. You've got to really be yielded to him in your life. And so what does that look like in your everyday life when it comes to sharing about Christ, when it comes to sharing your story, when it comes to 
sowing the seeds about who Jesus is and how he's changing you. What does that look like? And so today I want to talk to us for about three and a half hours. Um, Come on, I got some amens. No, I'm just teasing. Um, But I want to talk to us from this thought, so all can hear. So all can hear. I remember watching a video one day, uh, and there was a study being done on deaf children. And there was this new device and mechanism that they were trying out and testing on them to see if this would actually help them to hear. And there was about four or five cases where it actually worked, and they did a video recording of people actually experiencing hearing for the first time. And I'm telling you, if you are the most cerebral, stoic person, you would have still cried when you watched this video. Because it was amazing to see the response of the people who had never heard before. And all of a sudden, they could hear. You saw so many different facial expressions from the people that heard for the first time. But not only that, you saw the people that had been with them for years witnessing them never hearing, and that response was even greater. And my friends, I think about that. I believe that's how it is when we get a chance to help people hear the gospel and they respond to Jesus. Man, that's such an exciting moment to see. They got it. They understand. They're following Jesus. And sometimes we as a church don't do Christ justice enough. Because we feel like we have, when we come to Christ, we are this new person automatically, immediately, I'm sinless, I'm going to be perfect. When I remember talking to a guy the other day, he's like, yeah, man, I'm still struggling with pornography, I sleep with my girlfriend, but I love Jesus. And that's the response that most of us would get. Well, I don't think he's really a follower. No. He loves Jesus. He's just going through a process of sanctification. Guy outside of the church, man, he's smoking the ciggy, and then he goes to the back and roll up a joint. But he's in there worshiping, crying, giving his heart to Jesus, but he's on a process. And and that's where it gets messy because we often want to see the conversion experience, but we skip the discipleship experience to become a true follower of Jesus. And I have to remind myself, When I came to Jesus, man, it was an all dandy. It was this process of God making me holy, God making me to become like him. And that's why I really want to encourage this church, because sometimes we give up when it feels like, well, this person is a waste. They're not, they're far from God. No, 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 no. Don't judge the heart. Don't judge the heart. Leave that up to God. Just be willing to walk with people. Even if they don't know Jesus, that's a challenge for most of us as Christians because we ask, how many unsaved friends do we have? I said, man, I remember being on, at, my, at my church. We've got a great church, and most of our friends have been on staff. They've been in ministry, and uh, we went to this bar over across the street. Great wings. Oh, they have this salted caramel rosemary. Come on, I, I almost start speaking another language when I bit that. And I mean, just awesome, right? I'm, I'm biting and eating these wings, and a couple of our staff members said, man, we've never been here. They said, this is crazy. These wings are great. And it amazed me because they said we'd never been here, and it's literally two minutes from our church to cross the street. And I, t- I started taking all of our staff there. Hey, man, let's go over to this place. Let's go over and have these wings. And everybody that I took, oh, man, it was like the gospel of salted rosemary wings. It was just good news to everybody. But every person said, man, we've never been here. And it dawned on me, as a church staff, are we spending time around people that don't know Jesus? Are we in the, in the presence of people? Because remember what Jesus said in the Gospels. He said that he came to seek and save that which was lost. He said he didn't come to find the righteous, the holy people. No, he came to find the sick, the hurting, the lost people. And so Jesus was even persecuted because he spent time amongst sinners. So my friends, if we're ever going to help people to hear, we have to be in their presence. 
If we're ever going to help people to see who Jesus is in us, we have to be in their proximity. And so, my friends, I am really burdened this morning to help you and to challenge you and to equip you as a believer to get to a place in your life where you will do anything so that all may hear. Anything short of sin should be our motto. I will do anything short of sin for my youth schoolmate to come to Jesus. I will do anything short of sin for my colleague to come to Jesus. I will do anything short of sin from, for my neighbor to come to Jesus. I will do anything short of sin for my crazy uncle to come to Jesus. Anything. And my friends, I, I believe Jesus lived with this, this motto. His disciples lived with it. And so today, I, I want to talk to you from Romans chapter 10, and then I'm going to also read Luke chapter 10 as well. And so Luke chapter 10, verse 2, let's just kind of thumb Thumb that in your Bibles or on your iPhone or Android. And it says this in Luke chapter 10, verse 2. Then he, being Jesus, said to them, the harvest. Everybody say harvest. The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So, my friends, I want to help you understand something here in this context Jesus is encouraging his disciples, his followers, to pray to God, who is the Lord of the harvest. And he, before that, he sees all these people and has so much compassion. And that's what moved Jesus. If you want to be moved to reach people, if you want to be moved to be called, it's not an experience. It's not an encounter, per se. It's just having a passion for what Jesus had a passion for, which was people. It was the greatest two commandments. It was, number one, love God and love people. So I know if people aren't loving people enough, that's because they're really not loving God enough. I know if people aren't really sharing their faith with Jesus and they're not inviting people into a process of the kingdom and inviting people to faith church and inviting people to events and loving on Jesus because they love God, then they don't love God enough. And so they're growing, they got to go deeper in their love for God because it automatically spill over into people once you understand how much God loves you. And so Jesus was talking to his disciples and, and he really kind of addresses a problem. He, he, he tells us the good thing is the harvest is plentiful in this context, but he's talking spiritually even to us today. The harvest is the world, the world full of lost people. There's over 7,000 unreached people groups throughout the world. 3,000 of those are unengaged, meaning they've never heard the gospel. Okay, And so this is the world. Three billion people in the world have yet to hear the gospel. And so my friends, and that includes Tulsa. And so my friends, what Jesus is saying, the harvest is plentiful. There's a lot of possibilities for people to enter the kingdom. But the problem is we don't have enough laborers. The problem is we don't have enough of you gathering the harvest, of me gathering the harvest. And so he addresses this this great, big, really this awesome promise of there's so many people that can be reached, but the problem is there's few laborers to reach them. And and, and I want to just pause there because even in my heart of hearts, I'm... We have so much going on in the world today. We have great churches. This is like Tulsa, Jerusalem. I call it. It's, this is the, the city. This is the Mecca of the U.S., man. There's so many great churches doing awesome things here. But don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. It's not about the church. It's about the kingdom. And so we got to be cautious of, of just going from here to there to everywhere because it looks sexy. Because sexy wears off people. Like, I love what's happening around our world, man. So many great pastors are doing great things, and people are, I'm loving it. I'm like, yes, come to Jesus. But listen, if God's called you to be in a place, don't go somewhere else simply because you feel like it's sexy. Ask the people that's married. Yeah? Over the years, you don't look like you used to do. So there's something else that attracts me to you. There's something else that I've got to dig deeper into that relationship because looks are going to shift. Things are going to change. So I want to encourage some of you, man, you're in a great city, but this is a great church. You don't have to go look at it other places. No, 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 no. Be where God has planted you because where you're planted is where you'll blossom. Where you're planted is where you'll bloom. Be where God has planted you so that you can reach people for Jesus. And so Jesus addresses this problem. And I love here as we kind of read the next text is in Romans chapter 10. And this is Paul. I love what Paul says. Let's read Romans chapter 10. Verse 13 through 17, I love what he says here. He says, 
For whoever, everybody say whoever. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Woo, that's some good news right there. That's some good news, bro. That's some good for whoever, the drunkard, the prostitute, the stripper, the whoremonger, the, 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 the addict, the, whoever calls on the name of the Lord. That, that breaks down every barrier. Doesn't matter who you are, no matter how you look, how you smell, what you've done, what you aren't doing, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. My friends, this is the great promise that Jesus gets ready to unveil here. He says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear? Everybody say hear. Hear. How shall all hear without a preacher? So let me just pause there because when we say preachers, I'm people like, oh, I'm not a preacher. That's not what he's talking. He's not talking about a Pastor Kelly. He's not talking about a me. He's talking about someone who proclaims the gospel, someone who tries to persuade people under the power of the Holy Spirit by sharing the story of Jesus. And that can be in a one on one setting. That can be in a small group setting. That can be in multiple settings. He's not just talking about the preacher that we're used to. And he says, how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Then he says this. And how shall they preach unless they are Sent. I want to help you all understand this. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're sent. When you read Matthew 28, 19, go into all the world, you are sent. Now, God will send some of you to specific context, like he did Paul to the Gentiles, Peter to the Jews, uh, uh, Thomas. I was in India months ago, and I went I I did the trail where Thomas was. Thomas brought the gospel to India and began to help people. He he calls people to different contexts, and he may send you somewhere different, but he sends you. And so it says, how in the world shall they preach unless they are sent? And then I love this. It says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Then it goes on and says this, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. That's going to be liberating for some of you in just a moment. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? In the last verse, I want to read this chapter, verse 17. So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So let me walk you through three simple words here. Number one, the first word is problem. The second word will be promise. The third word will be plan. Let's talk about the problem. We read that in Luke. The problem is there are not enough laborers. The problem is there's a harvest out there of spiritually lost people in your schools, your university, your communities, your jobs, every arena of Tulsa, Broken Arrow, and all the other municipalities around. Every arena. There's enough lost people in our communities. The problem is there are not enough laborers. And when I think about this word laborer, a farmer knows how urgent the harvest is. When a a farmer goes out and plants his crops and his harvest and all these things, man, they are expecting a return on their harvest. They are expecting. If they weren't, they wouldn't have planted it. And so when I think about the, the, the veracity of a farmer and how important it is for him or her to begin to gather the harvest that is being, that is being sown and, and the crop that is growing and producing, it's so important because if they don't do it, then there's a problem. The problem is what they've sown will begin to spoil and be ruined. They lose income, they lose provision, all these different things. They can't pay the loans back to the bank. All these things just begin to trickle when there is no harvest. But Jesus lets us know that's not a problem because God's already done that. There is a harvest. There's people in our schools, there's people in our community, there's people in the world that do not know Jesus Christ. And so the problem Luke uh, Luke addresses and Jesus kind of talks about this in this particular verse in Luke 10 verse 2. But then I love Romans because Paul begins to address kind of the promise and the plan of God. And my friends, I want to help us understand something today. We're finding in so many research studies But the average Christian does not clearly know how to articulate the gospel. So that means if I would take you to QT right now and say, share the gospel with that person, most of us fear would rise up in us. 
the fear of rejection, the fear of failure, the fear of not being adequate. And we was like, oh, man, I, 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 I don't know what to do. And so as an evangelist, my job is to help equip you. As a pastor, his job is to help you grow and groom so that you'll be able to do that with boldness depending on the Holy Spirit, not so much as what you've learned, but depending on the Holy Spirit and what you have experienced through Christ. And so I want to help you. If you don't know how to share the gospel, that's going to be an action step with you. I need to study this 2020 to know the components of the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and to invite people to come into a saving relationship with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If that's you, then I want to encourage you to start studying. What, what, what is it going to take for me to help all here in my context? And so the problem Luke addresses, but I love Paul because he's such a great writer, and that's what we're going to camp out here for the next few moments in Romans 10. He gives this promise. In Romans 10, 13, he says something very great. He says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I remember being in Africa, and we were having one of our festivals. It's called an evangelistic mission festival, and thousands of people just began to come from the village, from the community. We had loud music, African dancing, all that. We, I mean, we do it all. It's great. And there's one drunk man. He came over. He came over with a stick, and he came over, and he was doing this dance. He was dancing. I mean, he was drunk, and he wasn't in the Holy Ghost. He was drunk. And the elders, as I got up to preach, the elders kind of started moving him. And they said, one guy said, let him be. So he stayed there, and he looked at me from the stage. I said, he's good. Let him be. By the end of the message, after I shared about the gospel, about Jesus, about how he frees us, about how he rescues us from sin that tries to keep us captive and in bondage, that man who was coming in there drunk was on his knees crying to God. And it was a sobering moment because one of the elders asked me, he says, this man is a drunkard in this African language. This man is a drunkard. And I said, okay. I said, let him be. He said, okay. By the end of the invitation, that man was still there crying out to God weeping with tears. In the moment, God was sobering him. He stood up, and I said, do you want to come to Jesus? I gave a mass call, and this man was the first one. I got a picture. I, I, I should have brought it up, but it was just a Holy Spirit moment I wanted to share with you. But he was lifting his hands like this. And we found out about a year later, that same man is now an elder in the church, <laughs> reaching other people for Jesus. It's amazing because whoever calls on the name, you may be looking at people in your context and you're looking down on them. You're, you're looking down on who they are and what they do and you're judging them and you're criticizing them and you have the spiritual gift of criticism, as so many of us do at times. It kind of just rolls up on us at times. But I want you to not discount a person because of who you see them as. I need you to start thinking and asking God, God, help me to see who you see them as. Help me to see who they will be. Because the thing that I want you to know, church, is many of us, none of us, deserve to be here. God didn't look at who we were and count us righteous. He looked at who we would become and count us righteous. That's the great work of Jesus and his grace. He didn't look at us and say, oh, you're good. You're perfect. I love those shoes. Those are awesome. Great haircut. Oh, man, you make enough money. Come on in. No. He says, we're a mess. We're sinful. We're depraved. We're, we're, we're condemned to hell and judgment. This is what the Bible says about people before they come to Christ. This is what the scripture says, church. But because of his grace, because of what Jesus did on the cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection to forgive the sins of mankind, he gives you and I an opportunity to put our trust in him and to believe what he did. He fulfilled the righteous requirements that none of us could have ever, ever fulfilled according to God's standards. And that's what makes Christianity such good news because there's no other religion that has a, a God that's alive. 
Jesus didn't just stay dead. He rose from the grave and he's still yet on the throne of heaven interceding for us, interceding for the world, praying with us. And he not only does that, he's not a distant God. Oh, come on. He gives us the Holy Spirit who goes with us. He walks with us. He comforts us. He speaks to us. He gives us gifts. He gives us talents to help us to advance the kingdom of God. Do we have a church today that would be willing to say, God, I die to myself so that your spirit can be alive in me and reach people that I never would have thought I could reach, go places I never would have thought I would go because of the Holy Spirit living inside of me and working through me. That's what he wants so that all can hear. So he gives us this promise, but I love God because he doesn't all just give a promise. He often gives us the plan. That's the, that's the next word I want you to think about, the plan. Let's unpack this here. Now, I'm going to get a little logical with you because this is kind of a logical scripture. How many of you read Romans 10 sometimes and you're like, what did he say? I want to try to help you understand what he says. It's almost this reverse context. So it's, it's deductive reasoning, but it's, it's almost this reverse context. I'm going to explain it here. Paul says in Romans 10, 14 through 16, is what we read. How then shall they hear? How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And then how shall they preach unless they are sent? And so it's these how should, how should they, how to's, all this. It's kind of challenging to understand, but I want to help you understand it. So this is a plan. This is really the plan of God. I want you to hear it. He starts with. Whoever calls on the Lord shall be saved. This is the absolute promise from Scripture. That's the absolute promise that Paul is letting us know. Jesus said in the word of God, the Holy Spirit used him to write this, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? And so if we think about it, in order for a person to be saved, they got to hear the call. And in order for them to hear the call... They need to believe. And once they believe, they got to believe because they've heard something. And as they heard something, they only hear because someone preached to them. And as a result of someone preaching to them, that happened because someone was sent. And so it's kind of this reverse backwards design if you think about it. And so I want to help us understand what Paul was saying here. And I want to break it down like this. God's role first. I want you to see God's role in this process. What is God's role? He has two roles in this process. His role is to send the believer and to save the sinner. You know why? Because God did everything he needed to do already. When Jesus died on the cross and gave up his life, his breath, his spirit, and said, it is finished, the work was finished. Satan had no more authority over sin, death, and the grave. Jesus Christ had captured that because of his life in Christ, and he he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. He completed the work of God when he died on the cross and was resurrected, so therefore sin has no more authority over us as humans because what Christ did okay and so God's role in this process is to send the believer and save the sinner that's what he that's what he does but then you have the actual question what's your role what's your role in this process I'm gonna tell you it's to go it's to go it's sharing the message of Jesus that's your role it's very simple I'll, I'll even add one for you give Give so that others may go. But I want to pause you there because some of you give yourself out of going. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, I give to that. No, 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 no. It's not either or. It's both hands. It's I need to give where I can't go. And if I can't go, maybe I need to ask God to open up an opportunity for me to go. But I always need to give to places where I may not be able to go so that others may go. But I also need to go where I can go. And so our role is to simply go, and I'll add the other one, is give. Jesus, God sends us, so we must respond in obedience to go. But then you have to ask yourself the question, what's the hearer's role? What's the hearer's role? What's the recipient's role? The person you're sharing with today when you go out to eat. The waitress you're praying with today. When you go out to eat, 
and you take your kids out to McDonald's this week, the person you get in a moment to pray with and just share a little bit about Jesus with them and sow that seed, what's their role? I want to pause here because this is really liberating for us as Christians, and I want you to feel the liberation that that is going to happen. And if you feel it, don't, don't be afraid. Just go ahead and jump up and say hallelujah when you feel it. You're good, you're good, you're good. But it says here, what's the hearer's role? They have two responsibilities, to hear and believe. To hear and believe. This is what Paul says. Listen to what he says. He said, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So in order to call on him, they must believe. Then he says, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? So we have an understanding that in order for them to call on Jesus, back to verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They have to hear and what? Believe. And so is it your responsibility for someone to believe? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's the liberating point right there. If you share about Jesus, if you share your story, if someone rejects you, if someone doesn't want to hear the, the mess about the gospel they feel like, remember, the Bible says to some people, this gospel is foolish. To those who are perishing, it's foolish. But it's not our job to help to, for somebody to believe. That's the Holy Spirit doing what he does, and it's their choice to either receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior based upon what they have heard you say as a result of preaching and being sent by God and allowing them to choose what the Holy Spirit's doing in them and to respond to the work that God is wanting to do in them. And if they choose not to believe, that's no pressure on you. That's so liberating. I remember being in a, a, a donut shop. I love donuts. My brother asked me for some donuts today. I said, no, get behind these, Satan. <laughs> I was in a do donut shop in St. Louis with a couple of our interns one night, and uh, we were talking to some college students. And there, as we were talking with them, uh, these young ladies were very articulate. They, they were really wise, and they probably ascribed to more of the uh, agnostic view. One was an atheist, one was an agnostic. An atheist is one who doesn't believe in God. An agnostic is one who kind of has some belief in God, but they haven't really put their, their thumb on it yet. And so we were talking to these young ladies, and as they were sharing, <clears throat> they were talking to us, telling us about what they believed and why they believed it. And we were listening and listening and asking questions. We were there for about two to three and a half hours. I mean, it was three in the morning. This is a 24-hour donut shop, by the way. Those are awesome. And um, so we were just sitting down talking, and it got to a point my intern looked at me. He's like, what, what is Will going to do now? And so I listened, and I talked, and I just, I didn't combat. I didn't fight. I just listened, and I asked questions, and I drew out of her what she was saying and wanted to hear her heart. And then finally, I got to a point where I said, can I share something with you? She said, yeah. This is when I shared the gospel. Just laid it out. When I was done, I said, what do you think about that? She said, that's absolutely ridiculous. This is beep, 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 And I'm just sitting there like this. And I waited and I said, how do you feel? She says, I can't believe that. I just can't believe what you're saying. So you mean to tell me that one day Jesus is going to come back and every person who doesn't receive the forgiveness of her sins will be, will be eternally damned? I said, I'm telling you what he said. She said, this is ridiculous. No, I, this is why I don't like Christianity. And she began to get up and pack her bags, and I said, before you go, would you mind if I just prayed? And she says, well, who are you going to pray to? I said, the guy you was upset about, Jesus. She said, well, I guess if you believe that, just go ahead. So we prayed. I just prayed for her. And I said, Jesus, I thank you for my friend. Thank you that she's allowed us to have a good conversation. And Lord, she's a little upset. You know her heart. You've created her. God, will you just reveal yourself to her? And also, show me where I may be off. I did that just to connect with her to make sure. I said, show me where I may be off so that I can continue to connect with people such great like her. I said, in Jesus' name, amen. I share that story with you because she absolutely rejected the gospel that day. She absolutely rejected it. Was it on me? No. I was liberated. We left excited. We left fueled. 
Because it was like, man, she heard about Jesus. Now it's up to her. And so, my friends, what I want to help you understand is when we sow the seed, I always expect. When I sow the seed of the word of God, I'm expecting it to do something. Why? Because it's alive. It's powerful. It's active. It knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And listen, that's up to the person to reject the growth that's happening in them. That's up to them to deny Jesus. That's not up to us. And so this is the great solution that we have. This is the great promise that we have. This is the great plan that we have in the gospel. We don't have to be afraid and in and, and fear because people reject God. They don't reject you. They reject God. But the only way people can have faith is it comes by hearing because Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing the message of Christ. And so it does not mean that, oh, I can live my life and let my light shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. No, they can't get saved that way. They get saved because they have heard about Jesus, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and an opportunity to invite them into a new kingdom and be changed as a person as the Holy Spirit is working, drawing them in their life. They get saved because we share the message. We share our story. So I just want to wrap up my thoughts today, helping you to understand, my friend, that there is a great problem in the world. A lot of lost people. But the bigger problem is there are not enough harvesters of laborers gathering the harvest, sowing the seed of the work, reaping the harvest that others have sown into, inviting people to come to Jesus. But we see that God gives us this great big promise that whoever calls on the Lord, that's so encouraging. Some of you have family that, that's far from God. Some of you have some friends or some acquaintances that's far from God, some colleagues that's far from God. And it says, whoever calls on the Lord. So we've got to be putting ourselves in a position to help them hear so that they can believe as a result of us being sent by preaching the word of faith, which is not far away. It's near us. It's in our mouth. And when they hear it, it becomes in their heart. So then they can have an opportunity to confess what's in their heart, believing that Jesus did die, did raise from the grave, and confess within their heart, with their mouth, so that they can be saved oh I feel good I don't know about you but I just I, I, I want you to get this today faith church because churches are in seasons this is a season that's coming up Easter Easter season resurrection Sunday it's a very vital momentous season for a church and so what I want to do is I want to put something in your hand today. I want to, I want to help you get some tools in your hand to be like, who, man, who, who, who can I invite? Who can I share my story with? Who can I say, hey, hey, I don't know if you go to church, my friend, but I would just love to have you on our Easter Sunday service. Man, it's going to be a great, awesome time with fellowship of people from all different types of backgrounds in Tulsa and Tulsa, Jerusalem and all these different places. And I just would love to have you come over and join with me. Let's go to lunch afterward and just talk. Tell me what you think about it. Just, and just begin to invite people. Just begin to invite people. Invite, 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 young people just begin to invite, 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 invite. I'm going to bring you to school. I'm going to do something called crash. I'm going to get you in my car. I'm going to just crash jump you. Hey, where you going today? I don't know. You're going to church. Come on over here and just get them in my car. I'm talking about what would happen if we just start doing that? What happened? Just imagine if one of you each week invited five people one day a week. You know the return? I can give you some exponential return. Some of you business people out there, I can help. Listen, the return of that would be awesome. If you have 500 people come here on, on the Easter, you're like, oh, man, we got to go two services. This is crazy. We got people in the forest. Oh, my gosh, people are coming. It all happens not because stuff is sexy. It happens because you have people sharing, inviting, witnessing, caring, loving, serving to come and help people enter into the kingdom of God. That's what happens. And so, my friends, I want to wrap up our time with this. We're going to have the worship team you can come back and join me here. God gave us a great plan. You've heard today your role is to go. Go and preach the message. Go and share the message. Go and share the message. Go and... Let me ask you this question. What, what must you do this year so that everybody you know that does not know Jesus can hear what must you do this year in your life that'll be different? So that everybody you know, or may not even know, that you believe that doesn't know Jesus, is not following him, can hear about him. 
What is that? I told you earlier, maybe you need to start studying what the gospel is. Ask yourself the question, do I really know the gospel and the components of it? Ask yourself the question, do I, do I know why Jesus died? Do I know the, the, the repercussion of what's going to happen if someone doesn't come into the kingdom? Do I really know that? Do, do, do I know my story? Can I share that in a way that's clear? Can I share it in three minutes and 30 seconds? 30 minutes if I have the opportunity. Can I share my story? I want you to just begin to reflectively think about what you need to do this year so that it all can hear in your context. And the reason why, my friend, is because everything you do in life is connected to this as a believer. Your purpose is connected to reaching people for the gospel. Your purpose is not to make money and have a great 401k or 3B and have great vacations and all that. No, 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 no. That's just what we sometimes want. What God wants is for you to use the gifts that he's given you so you can help people enter the kingdom. And as a benefit, sometimes we get to enjoy those things. And I want you to just begin to think, what do I have to do this year in my life so that everyone that I know or come into contact with may hear about Jesus? I'm going to tell you just a few things you can do. Number one, you can start praying. Ask yourself the question, my friends, how many times in the past year have I consistently prayed for a lost person? We have something, I have something in my my Bible. It's a tool I can send it to a pastor and the staff. It's our prayer cards. You're looking online. And, And every morning, when I'm having my abiding time, I'm getting up, I'm praying for these people calling them out to Jesus. I'm praying scriptures over. But I don't just pray. I'm I'm, I'm having conversations when I have the moments and the opportunities as God will create them. I'm saying, God, give me an opportunity. That's what Paul prayed in, in, in Colossians 4. God, give me an opportunity to share the gospel. How many times have you prayed that? When's the last time have you prayed that? God, give me an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody. I want to tell you, that is a prayer He's going to answer every time. And most of us know it, so we don't pray. (laughs) Young people, when's the last time we shared the gospel with a friend at school? When's the last time you took them to Starbucks and just got to hear their life? Just listened in to them. Said, man, people think you're weird, but I don't. I look, man, let me hear your story. Talk to me. I'm telling you, it goes a long way. My friends, we've got to get to a place in our life as the church where we stop being Pharisees. We can put on our makeup, we can put on our nice shoes, our good jackets, our fresh haircuts, but listen, the world cares nothing about that stuff. The world cares about is a solution to a void in their heart that they're searching for in all the wrong places. And that's Jesus, church. That's Jesus, the hope of glory that lives inside of us. How many of you understand that the hope of glory as a follower of Jesus is living inside of us? Oh my God, when you go somewhere, the atmosphere changes because Jesus is inside of you. When you go to work in the morning, the atmosphere shifts. When you go to Walmart, the atmosphere shifts. When you go to eat this afternoon, the atmosphere shifts because Jesus is inside of you. But we got to stop living church like he's not. Come on. Let's do it. Let's go get some people. Let's go fishing, as I would say. Let's go get some people. So you got to pray. The other thing, you got to go. Just go. Just go. Nike, I love the slogan. Just do it. It's very simple, isn't it? Most of you love Nike, you wear them. Just do it. I said, just go. Just go. I'm going, I'm going to share Jesus with them. No fear. No, I feel the fear, but uh-uh. No, because fear is from the devil. The Bible says it's the spirit of fear. It's not from God. On the other hand, God gives us love, power, and a sound mind. And so just go. Just go this week. Just go. Just go in your youth group. Just go in your school. Just go in your job. Just go in the community. Just go to your neighbor. Just go. Say, man, I'm going to love on you. How are you? Do you know about Christ? Can I invite you to, to have fellowship with me in my church? I love And if they reject you, guess what? Just go back again. Just go. How many times do you know in the Bible? where there was a woman in the well, not at the well, but there was a woman who was a widow and there was a judge. 
and she wore the judge out. She wore him out. He said, this lady is driving me crazy. If I don't do what she's asking me to do, this is driving me crazy. So when they reject you, so what? Go again. When they reject you, so what? Go again. When they reject you, so what? Go again. Just go. Pray. Go. Lastly, I shared this with you. Give. Some of us, we got to rev up our giving. The Bible says what's in our heart comes out of the mouth. But it also says that where our treasure is, there our heart is also. Some of us got to rev up our giving this year. Come on, in the projects for, for missions and for projects around the community, for outreaches and for your offerings and tithes. Above all, we got to raise it up. We got to get it up. We got to give to the kingdom. We got to give to reach people. We got to give to help the kingdom grow. Got to raise it up. And so these are just a few things that I wanted to share with you. But you have to take a moment this week ask God yourself what is the Holy Spirit inviting me to do so that all may hear so listen I want to invite you to stand with me right now it's a very simple message church not anything crazy theological about it as I was just sharing with you I just returned from Saudi and I saw the joy in these believers that I hadn't seen in a long time and I'm asking myself, how in the world can the youth and the young adults and these elderly people that love Jesus from a different country but are immigrants in another country have so much joy when they're not accepted, when they're marginalized, when they're only used for their labor and service of work, and at the same time they're taxing them like crazy, trying to get them out of the country, but they have all this joy. How is that? And it reminded me of what Jesus said. The peace that I give to you, the world can't take it away. The old church would say, this joy that I have, this joy that I have, you didn't give it to me, you can't take it away. Church, if we don't have the joy of the Lord, it won't spill over. But when you have joy, it just spills out of you. When you're at work and asking, why are you smiling all the time? They ask, why do you do that? Why'd you make it? Why, why'd you think like that? Why'd you make that decision? Why didn't you do it this way? Oh, because God's in me. I love Jesus, man. He wants me to. Jesus free. Awesome. Because even Paul said it. If I'm crazy for Jesus, it's because of your benefit. It's not for anybody else. It's because of your benefit so that you can know who he is and have an understanding to come to him. And so I.